against Bam. So here we're really sort of seeing the end of this. So we see God floating or hovering, um, uh, this muscular, powerful representation, almost reminiscent as if the Christian God is being cast in the guise of the classical God, Zeus. The representation of Adam that we see to the side, reclining on the riverbank. He actually recalls the, um, the representations of river gods that you would see in classical art also. Um, or even sort of think about some of the reclining figures. Um, remember when you were in Survey 1 and you studied the pediments on top of things such as the um, Parthenon and the Acropolis, the figures that fit down into the little tight corners of the triangle often are reclining or lying down. Um, so Adam recalls that also. What else might you point out to somebody? Yes, Emily. Um, if we look at the more relaxing living thing, we're not really Yeah, you've got this wonderful tension of the calm relaxedness um, of Adams, just struggling and you know, holding his hand up, versus the power and authority um, that you see with the representation of God. Yes. Yeah, it will give him that sort of bolt of energy. What else? Yes. Um, the behind depiction of God is a bunch of um, people, and it's kind of technology because it's hearkening to what's to come and to the future of mankind, and whether that's Eve or that's Mary, and then the, the child who could be Jesus. Yeah, those figures there again are up for debate. Um, but there's been a lot of discussion about, this has long been believed to be an association with Eve, uh, simply because of her glancing over at Adam and went, uh-huh. Uh, but the, the prominence in which God's arm sort of drapes around her and then sits on the shoulder of the child. Um, and these two figures together, where we often see Adonai and child, um, has raised the question of is, while it's not a literal representation, can we see this as another sort of technological gesture, where you have Old Testament sort of referring to the New Testament. Um, anything else you might want to raise? Yes, Laura. The shape that God is in is um, suggestive of a brain, and the um, the besides the brain, there is a lot of um, it's a lot of showing how Michelangelo um, understood the organs um, and I've heard that I don't know if it's a cervix if that actually then the red can oh, really oh, I haven't heard cervix no okay I heard that on one smart history I was like, I heard that. really um, okay good um, <laughs> where to stop with it <laughs> um, anyway um, okay cord. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, the brain is the sort of constant that we've often heard before, so that sort of cross okay. section. And that, <laughs> that, that plays into sort of the, the metaphor of that God is not simply giving life to Adam, um, but he's giving intellect to Adam also. Whether or not that was Michelangelo's intention, we simply don't know. It's not like he left behind notes. Um, so there's a lot of speculation that goes into reading some of these symbols um, beyond sort of the biblical gesture and the difference of the gesture, the more relaxed gesture versus the more determined gesture, but then that separation. Again, you have to remember you were never supposed to see the ceiling close up like this. You were always supposed to see it from some 70 feet down below, and that appearance then of the fingers touching actually visually appears as if they're just touching, uh, whereas here we obviously see an inch or so of space. Um, so it sort of is, is intended to kind of heighten the drama when it's seen again in that Now, moving away from the creation of Adam,
to the last judgment altar wall. Is this an especially groundbreaking representation of the last judgment? Was it Canard? 
regarded as part of this quest for mythology thing? It, 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 if it's not prevalent, then it would be an outlier. But again, I don't have the, I don't have the answer to that. That would be one for, for Dr. Murphy. Good question. One more question. Sure. Was the um, the loincloths that are there, is that their original, was that originally like that, or are those painted on after? Those were painted on after. So um, there was no loincloths anywhere? No, all of these little swags that you see, those were yeah. added by, when we get to the uh, Protestant Reformation and the Catholic Reformation, we'll talk about what's called the Council of Trent. And during the Council of Trent, you had the painter of underpants is sort of his unofficial title, but he went through. And remember when we talked about the Brancacci Chapel? Right. And I showed you the image then of Adam and Eve and the little leaves that were painted on. Right. All, in every chapel, any religious representation, they went through and they painted over. And even classical sculptures, there's, um, um, uh, there's kind of a, it's an art history joke. Um, but uh, they, they went through and they removed the genitals from classical sculptures and put fig leaves on the sculptures. So the joke is that somewhere in the Vatican archives, <laughs> there's a big box of <laughs> classical. So, yes. Um, was there like a point where people were like shocked This, this is when we begin to see the push back. So Savonarola was sort of the start of this sort of raging conservatism, mm -hmm. but there will be this growing tide against paganism, especially as we move towards the Protestant Reformation. Mm -hmm. 
they blame the church as sort of going astray, not because the church was corrupt before mm -hmm. the High Renaissance, but it's something to sort of blame. Uh, so we will sort of see that backlash against paganism. So when we get to the wrong time period, you won't see, you won't see representation of God in physical form. Um, you won't see paganism anymore. You'll see a return to orthodoxy. So that pendulum of the sort of liberal spirit, progressive spirit of the Renaissance and studying the classical world goes back the other way. You've got that shift to the conservatives going, no, we need to, to stay faithful. And then it'll revert back. And once we get to 18th century and the Rococo and the French, they just let it go. Yeah. Um, so you constantly have this push and pull. And one of the things you know to, to always remember, whether it's uh, in art history, this shift, and we're seeing it now. For years, we saw um, you know, abstraction in art, and then it shifted back to realism in the 1990s. Um, so whenever you see this kind of shift, it's literally, it's not just a seesaw back and forth, but it's almost sort of think of it, it's moving at an angle, so it's a slow progression of change. Um, but yeah, we will see that as we move, especially through the 1500s and into the very early 1600s. Yeah, because I know down the hall from the Sistine Chapel as Michelangelo is working on the ceiling, the young artist named Raphael has begun work on what is called the School of Athens or philosophy. And let me tell me, this is in the room of the Stanza della Segnatura. Why? What was that room? Yes. Uh, did we just write down the hall from the Sistine Chapel? Uh, yeah, but why, is, why this room? I know what you're referring to. I'm trying to get to. Okay. What was that st structure? You're reminded of a structure. What was that? Do you remember? Anvil art. Art. 
Dolls. Arch. Yes. Triumphal arch. There we go. Yes. Remember the classical triumphal arches. Those bits of Roman architecture that are all across the Italian peninsula. Of course, portals that the Roman armies would march through on their way victorious back into the city of Rome. Monuments to the empire. So yes, you should immediately sort of think, ah, it kind of looks like a Roman triumphal arch. It's the back setting. So again, it gives us this classical setting. But if we look at this, it almost looks like we're looking at a series of arches. We have one, obviously, here where we see the coffers, the coffers, uh, C-O-F-F-E-R-S. Those are simply the recessed panels that you often see in these sort of barrel vaulted arches. And then we progress back. We see another arch repeat. And then a third arch in the background. So it creates the perspective that some of you were noting as you look, you see that the orthogonals, terms that I have learned are familiar to some of you, um, are the diagonal lines that you see the, uh, uh, the compositional elements are lining up to to direct our eye back to here. And even if we look at the floor also, the floor is set up along uh, those diagonal lines or orthogonals so that they converge then at the height of men, but not on any single men, but rather in between them. Now, before we move away from the backdrop, as we look at this architecture, it's also a reference to something being built. So it's a, a one, in one way, it recalls classical, but in another way, it is very contemporary built right next door to the Catholic New St. Peter's, New St. Peter's Basilica. New St. Peter's, they set the foundation. So what you're looking at is also a reference to the, um, the classically inspired architecture of New St. Peter's because peeking out between this arch in this arch, what do we see? Ah, the base of a dome. So, what you have here is the crossing, or the reference to the crossing of the nave and the transept, where you would have a dome here, and the nave is a large archway, and the transept is a large archway. So it recalls a classical tradition, but it's also referring to contemporary Christian architecture that is being built, the new St. Peter's Basilica. Remember, let's see if I can find them. of the classical past and the contemporary Catholic is important because that's a theme that runs through the entire painting. So this, and this is, a, and that's a theme of the Renaissance is it's not replacing Christian and Catholic beliefs with pagan, it's that peacefully sort of coexisting together. Understanding sort of the connection between the past and the present, that's the rebirth of the classical. Okay, so that's our study. Painted as if using his eye, the term you probably, hopefully, some of you will remember when we talked about the Ghent altarpiece and we looked at the painted representations of the sculptures of St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist. So, here again, we have painted representations of sculptures. Anybody familiar with any of those attributes that they might recognize? Thoughts about who they might be? How do you think about being like Apollo and Apollo's Ah, we have Apollo to one side. He's holding the 
attribute of the lyre that kind of looks like a little harp. Um, Apollo we often associate with the arts, poetry, music. On the other side, we have another figure. Thoughts? Ah, goddess of war. Shield, spear, helmet. We also associate her with the mechanical arts. So you have contrast here. You can almost think of it between when you talk about the, the liberal arts uh, and the sciences or the mechanical engineering side. So these two sides of arts. Now the figures, we'll start talking about these two figures because obviously as one point linear perspective sets it up, they really are a focal point. But you have clusters that we're going to talk about because there's a lot of sort of notable individuals here. So let me back up to these two. So we have two figures striding together. One has great strappy sandals, the other is barefoot. Both of them are wearing sort of classical style clothing. You see the toga draped over uh, a tunic. Both of them are carrying books. One has a long white beard, one has shorter brown hair. And both of them are gesturing. So here we have sort of the, the theme of the entire mural, philosophy. We have Plato and Aristotle. The philosopher Plato, white beard. Aristotle holding his treaties or his book on ethics. Brown. Just as you have these sort of this dichotomy of these sort of opposites of the two realms of arts on either side of the um, uh, the temple, these two figures represent two sides of philosophy. Any philosophy majors in the house? Oh, Bobby, you're all over it then. Plato comes first. Okay, we'll start there. Yes, Plato comes first. Anybody familiar with Plato's ideas? Yes. Okay, yes, there is the allegory of the cave. Plato, um, uh, whether it's the, you know, the, the, the books of the Republic, um, Plato's philosophy in general. Uh, talks about this idea of truth. Where does truth for Plato lie? He tells you, but go ahead, Lord. Well, it's not on Earth. It's not on Earth. In the forms. Yes. It's not in an earthly realm where like we're questioning or whatever. Right. Notice his gesture points up. So it's the idea of this search for truth and understanding truth. Bobby? I know the next part is talking more about like the student access to technology. Yeah. So what we have here are two different schools of thought. With philosophy, with Plato, as he gestures upwards, he's talking about this idea of universal truth lies beyond. Um, if I can use the, the idea from uh, the Book of Republic's book, where he talks about the concept of what art is. Um, art is an idea. Chair. I'll use the example of chair. There's, an, there's a concept of chair that exists as an idea. Then you have a craftsman who makes a chair. So that's a copy of an idea. Then you have an artist that makes a copy of the copy of the idea. So what we have with Plato is universal truth lies out there, above us. With Aristotle, his gesture forward, universal truth lies here, in the physical world, in the material world, and what we can see and what we can touch. contrasting ideas of truth and where truth lies. But here they're presenting almost, um, not fighting with each other, but existing in balance. Much like 
much like what the Renaissance is focused on. And if Christianity puts truth out here, that for the, the, the Renaissance and the ancients, truth lies within the physical, but what we can see. Yeah. Something about call, it was to prove that reality exists. Okay. I could be wrong. I'm pretty sure it's one of these guys that said it. Okay, so we have our two figures that are engaged then in this debate of where universal truth lies. And it's as if they're, again, striding and talking. You have a sense of this if you saw two of your professors walking across campus arguing um, about what is better, medieval art or modern art? So the representation of Plato is actually based on one of Raphael's mentors. Does he look familiar? Even a little. Yeah. Who does he look like? Da Vinci. He is based on the representation of Da Vinci. Throughout this painting, what Raphael does is he combines then men of contemporary era of the Renaissance period with individuals of the classical period. So coexisting together. So yes, this is based on the representation of Leonardo da Vinci, who again, uh, Raphael was a fan. Here's our image of Apollo, just a second here. Oh, in the School of Athens, down at the bottom here, prominently placed, we have another figure. He's leaning against this
listening then to a discussion between Ptolemy, who is holding then an orb of the stars, uh, and Zoroaster, who is holding then uh, the Earth. something that is brewing for some time. This is not, they don't all just wake up in 1517 and go, you know what, we don't like this situation. Um, instead, there were problems before that. There was discontent. Um, and it's different depending on different parts of Europe. So Martin Luther up in the area of Germany, they have a very different perspective on what's going on with the Catholic Church than they do living down in Rome or in Vatican. So you have different sort of perspectives on this, but the Protestant Reformation, as Protestant, it is a protest. It is a protest against the Catholic Church. I was so that I'm in the Catholic Church. <laughs> Loaded question. What, but what was that? Why, why were they protesting? What do they have to be upset about? There was, at the time, on the Catholic Church, that was one of the bigger issues of the Catholic Church was that they were selling out indulgences. Ah. Pretty much like uh, get out of, uh, pretty much get into heaven, like free cards. Because like, hey, the Catholic Church, they would bless you with the washy of whatever system you were Yeah, the sale of indulgences was a big one. Um, which, of course, the belief was that you could buy your way into heaven. And there were various ways of doing that. You could make a big donation to the Catholic Church. Hey, you know, I've been a jerk my whole life, but. Let me write you a check. Uh, and that they believe that that would somehow like seal your spot up there behind the pearly gates. Um, also, uh, where you were buried. Uh, even uh, the idea of if you were buried within the church, the closer if you could afford, uh, like real estate, if you could afford a spot in the church floor closer to the altar, well, you were closer to heaven. But if you were poor folk, you were buried out back. Um, and your chances of making it to heaven were that much harder because you're further away. Uh, so it was all based on, on how much money you had. So it was a class issue, partially, uh, that would get people fired up. What else? Is that the only problem? Is it some people have more money than others? Yes. 
Taking in things that you would expect your Catholic priest not to. Um, you also had corruption in monasteries. You had corruption in nunneries. So at every level, things had gone awry. The Catholic Church is so large. How do you manage something like that? And when money is involved, corruption happens. It's kind of human nature. So all of this came to a head. People became increasingly upset uh, with the behaviors uh, and the uh, corruption that was going on and the large amount of money that was being accrued by this institution. So the list of complaints finally mailed up on the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral by, uh, excuse me, by Martin Luther, 1517. This will impact our world. This will have ramifications for the next 100, 100 Where you are in Europe uh, plays a role in how artists um, are reacting or responding and how patrons are reacting and responding to these events. One of the things that will happen is that you'll see new styles, new patrons begin to emerge. Now, it's not immediate. You don't have 19, uh, excuse me, uh, 1517 and everybody wakes up. Protest is underway. There's going to be changes. It's, it's just not that easy. Um, it, the word of what has happened has to spread. That can take years, if not decades, to work its way across Western Europe. Um, and then the uproar, the, the, the rejection, the iconoclasm will happen. What's iconoclasm? You have artists that um, uh, there is a reduction of representations. You have um, changes in what is being represented by the iconoclasm is, is, is a bit more than that. Um, we almost had the destruction of classical music, the destruction of so uh, cathedrals, great examples if you ever find yourself in England and you went to the countryside, you still have see the remnants of the iconoclasm, where basically they went into cathedrals, they tore down the altar pieces, they took clubs and beat the faces away from representations of saints, um, removing their faces, seeking to destroy art. Um, so destroying those sort of representational images, those are false gods. So the outright destruction of art begins to take place. Today we call that censorship. Um, but the iconoclasm was a very sort of powerful event that would rock the art world because if you're destroying works of art, why are you going to commission more works of art? So you have fewer commissions that actually start to happen um, uh, at this time period. And, and different groups begin to move into positions of hatred. Right? Well, did the iconoclasts of that time, um, were they against all imagery uh, depicting holy figures that would be worshipped? But what about crucifixes and pictures of Jesus and the cross? That have always been very confused. Everything was destroyed. Depending on where you had um, the most sort of conservative groups, you had the destruction of great images because to worship a representation, you were typically, oh, you're, you're worshiping that Satanism. You're worshiping that figure. You're not worshiping God. So the most severe ones just wanted the, the cross. Yeah. And that was about imagery. Mm -hmm. And yeah. whitewashed walls and churches. Right. I think that that whole simple yeah. thing. Okay. <coughs> okay. So this event has happened. Now, a 
again, we're not going to see the impacts of this for another 20, 30 years after it has originally happened. But just know it's brewing. This discontent, while it hammer comes down in 1517, there was discontent in 1500, uh, particularly in Northern Europe. In the 1400s, people were ticked off with the Catholic Church. So this is all brewing over here and will bubble up and start to impact stuff. As all of that is starting to unfold, we have this new style that begins to emerge that comes after the so-called High Renaissance era. Mirrors. Yeah. Mannerism is from the Italian word maniera, in the manner of, is how that sort of roughly translates. And you see there's a profound stylistic shift that we see. So if we go back to our old friend here, um, uh, the representation of Giotto, Still, Italian Byzantine-esque, but a little foot into naturalism, a little bit more representation of the figure, a little bit more space accurately represented. We move away from that sort of stylized, but becoming natural representation of figures to Da Vinci, Madonna of the Rocks. So the subject matter is exactly the same. But obviously we see greater interest in representing the natural world. Then we arrive in mannerism. So the people, as art history was forming as a discipline in the 19th century, they saw this as perfection. And then, long, long, then art just went downhill all the way until you get into the, you know, modern art. Naturality, this is again just this sort of shift that we'll see unfold across time. Mannerism. Mannerism is a movement that's largely sort of rooted with developing first in and around Florence, which is sort of interesting with the, the High Renaissance taking root in Florence, that this is where you see it begin early, and where you see mannerism begin to overtake it. But Florence really sort of the, the leader of the pack in terms of driving stylistic changes. What strikes you as notably different stylistically? Subject matter is relatively the same, but stylistically, where are we seeing change? Yeah. The colors are more pastel like. Ah, shift in color. So we go from heavy gold, heavy blue and red. Continuing on with the blue and red, so very clear iconographical use of color that we see here. The tone, because of course it is uh, Da Vinci, that dusk light, so it's more natural. Ah, and then the colors. The colors are jarring. Even if we were to compare it with a fresco, the sort of pastel pinks and oranges and reds, the colors clash. What else? composition, you see a depth and space, but you still have the order that's used or implied with that triangle. We still have a center focus for a subject. We get over here and it's chaotic. Figures overlap, we don't know where they are in space. What else? Carlson? More to the artificial place in the background, more so than well, we did see that before with the other subject, but it's more of like, it reminds me of what, like if you take portraits in, a, in a studio, <laughs> just the like flat, one sheet. Yeah, the backdrop, and yeah. the, the fake cloud, and then the distance <laughs> when you're doing your snapshot. Yes, yeah. So you have this 
suggestion of a background with this really cute little kooky cloud up in the corner, the, let me ask you a question. Where does the background end and where does the land begin? Yeah, what are we missing? The horizon line, that all important horizon line that the Renaissance artists love because that anchors everything. The horizon line organizes space clearly so that you can create perspective. Ah, we don't really have a sense of space here. We see ground, we see sky, but we don't really see where that line is and that that crutch that we rely on to represent space, perspective. Well, we've got nothing in the center. In fact, look at how the artist has deliberately moved all of the figures to the periphery and left the center somewhat sort of devoid of a focal point. What else strikes you as different about Nothing about this, the balance, the proportion, um, uh, getting a sense of the figures being grounded in the space, nothing appears visually or natural in its presentation. Remember when we looked at um, some of the works from the early Renaissance and the sort of high Renaissance, we take for example the Davids. Here's a youth that has just cut someone's head off. I've never done it personally, but I would assume I'd be upset. I would hope that you would be upset if you were standing on a severed head. Um, but those faces completely devoid of emotion. And here, what do you notice about the expression? Seen any artists use body language before? Da Vinci and his gestures. Ah. 
gestures, eyes. Da Vinci always used the eyes. Remember the eyes and the gestures to move you around, to create um, order, to communicate a concept. Here the artist is deliberately using eyes and gestures to create disorder. Sometimes it's referred to as the sign from the cross, sometimes it's entombment. I see people refer to it as lamentation. Again, they have deliberately left out those key iconographical symbols that we need when we come to a painting to either go, that's the Annunciation, or that's the lamentation, or that's the descent from the cross, or that's Hercules, or that's David. Those symbols that we associate with those figures.
elegant, stylish, new. Just as any time a style changes, there's always sort of that reaction to, that's weird. In Florence, this is where mannerisms evolve. Why do you have creating something that was dramatically different to all of the order and the structure that we associate with the high renaissance and the renaissance, and throwing it away to create something that goes against those conventions? deliberately attenuated, elegant. The tiny little head, the, the out of proportion body, very reminiscent of things that we saw Michelangelo doing as he was beginning to distort the body on the Sistine Chapel ceiling, on the Last Judgment altar wall, 1535. These, um, with the Last Judgment, we're beginning to see overlap here with this movement known as mannerism. Now while here we have the Virgin in the center of the scene, we have unbalance because one side is left open. This work also is not completed. The other side is crowded with figures. You have a swoop mm -hmm. or a sweep of fabric filling the corner, but you have all of these figures crammed into this small space. We even have figures where the bodies are literally cut off, cropping of the figures. This is something they didn't do in the Renaissance. In the Renaissance, they very carefully go back to Perugino, Christ of the Saint Peter. Everybody is scooched in. Everybody scooch in so that you fit within the frame, within the composition. We don't want to cut your head off or cut your body off. The mannerists do because it distorts, it confuses. Okay, we're gonna have to stop here. We'll come back with mannerism on Wednesday. I need to give your test back.